Welcome back to the Cisco CCNA3 Enterprise Networking Security and Automation Lecture Series. If you haven't seen my previous lecture series covering CCNA1 and CCNA2, I will leave links in the description for those playlists. I would recommend that you go through the previous CCNA lectures before you move forward with this course. Today I will be covering WAN concepts which is module number 7. In this module, the primary objective is to explain how WAN access technologies can be used to satisfy business requirements. We will cover the purpose of WAN, WAN operations, traditional WAN connectivity, modern WAN connectivity and internet-based connectivity. The purpose of WANs LANs and WANs a WAN or Wide Area Network is a communications network that spans over a relatively large geographical area and is required to connect beyond the boundary of the LAN. And on this table on the bottom of your screen, we have summarized the concepts belonging to LANs and WANs. So LAN or Local Area Networks provides network services within a small geographic area. WANs, on the other hand, provides network services over a large geographical area. LANs are used to interconnect local computers and devices within each other. While the WANs are used to interconnect remote users, networks and sites. LAN is owned and managed typically by an organization or the home user, while the WANs are owned and managed by internet service providers, telephone network systems, cable and satellite providers. LANs, other than the network infrastructure cards, uh, there is no uh, fee to use it. So if you have configured your LAN network within your home or your small business or enterprise business, uh, there is no usage fee within that LAN network other than the cost associated with building that network. However, the WAN services are provided for a service fee, hence that's where the service providers such as ISP come into play. LANs provide high bandwidth speeds using wired Ethernet and Wi-Fi services, while the WAN offer low to high bandwidth speeds over long distances depending on uh, your packages and coverages. So those are the key differences between LANs and WANs. And on the right hand side, Cisco has provided to us with a a nice little diagram where you see the LANs being things like enterprise campuses, like these could be LANs, like right behind these switches, those are LANs, and uh, also remote sites uh, behind the, uh, the the remote site router is a LAN, but what it the WAN is doing is interconnecting those campuses uh, with each other which is a wide area network. So that's what it's showing on here on the right hand side. So there's a building backbone, campus backbone, even this uh, remote site behind the router are LANs, while what is interconnecting them is a WAN. Private and public WANs. A private WAN is a connection that is dedicated to a single customer. A private WANs provide the following, guaranteed service level, consistent bandwidth and security. A public WAN connection is typically provided by an ISP or telecommunication service provider using the internet. In this case, the service levels and bandwidth may vary and the shared connections do not guarantee security. So an example of a private WAN could be that the University of Calgary and SAIT may connect their campuses together with a private WAN. A public WAN could be that you are using a internet service provider such as Showcable to access the internet. So that could be the public WAN. So most common use of a private WAN that I have seen is the academic institutions connecting against each other, uh, with each other, so that they can uh, securely communicate 
uh, research data between their organizations, but also uh, maybe use in like uh, private organizations like uh, big companies, uh, for example. WAN topologies. WANs are implemented using the following logical topology designs. They include point-to-point -point topology, hub and spoke topology, dual home topology, fully mesh topology, and partially mesh topology. And I will cover some of these items, all of these items in a brief high-level overview in our next few slides. Uh, but please note the large networks usually deploy a combination of these topologies instead of sticking to one of the topologies. So it's, they will be combining multiple of those topologies together uh, to create those large networks. So let's look at point-to-point -point topology. The point-to-point -point topology employs a point-to-point -point circuit between two endpoints. It involves a layer two transport service through the service provider's network. The point-to-point -point connection is transparent to the customer network. So note it can become expensive if too many point-to-point -point connections are required. So the point-to-point -point topology basically connecting two sites together using that point-to-point -point, uh, WAN topology. And it typically, like it, it uses the layer two transport service. And uh, the po problem with this is that if you are using uh, too many point-to-point -point topologies on your large uh, infrastructure, uh, that's going to become uh, an expensive uh, way of connecting those sites because, you know, the point-to-point -point requires a more equipment and more resources to run. Hub and spoke topology. This enables a single interface on the hub router to be shared by all spoke circuit. So that's where the hub and spoke come from. So you have a hub and then this hub router will be connected to multiple other routers. These are called spokes. So the hub and spoke topology. So the spoke routers can be interconnected through the hub router using virtual circuits and routed sub uh, interfaces. Spoke routers can only communicate with each other through the hub router. So what makes this a hub and spoke topology is that if this spoke router A needs to communicate to spoke router C, it has to go through the hub. That's why it's called hub and spoke topology. So every, every spoke router goes through the hub router. Therefore, that's why it's called hub and spoke topology. Please note the hub router represent a single point of failure in this case, because anytime this device needs to communicate to this device, it has to go through the hub. And if the hub fails, none of these devices won't be able to reach this device or this device won't be able to reach any of these devices. So if the hub fails, the entire uh, system is going to go down. So in other words, the interspoc communication do fail where the hub become unavailable. So down on the disadvantage of hub and spoke topology is that it has a single point of failure, which is the hub, and that would result in a uh, network outages. Dual home topology. So this type of topology offers enhanced network redundancy, unlike the other one, uh, the hub and spoke one, and load balancing, distributed computing, processing, and the ability to implement backup services, service provide, uh, provider connections. So as you can see on the diagram on the bottom of your screen, the dual home topology have the redundancy built into it, load balancing, distributed computing and processing, and the ability to implement backup services and connections because they are connected through multiple links and it doesn't have a single point of failure. However, it is more expensive to implement than the single home topologies. This is because they require additional networking hardware, such as additional routers and switches. It is more difficult to implement these because they require additional and more complex configuration as well uh, because of the complexity of the network. However, the advantages, as mentioned before, is the as a result of the dual home topology having multiple connections to these hubs as opposed to having a single point of failure. 
fully mesh topology and partially mesh topology. So in this situation, uh, what happened, it uses virtual circuits to connect all sites. So it is, it has a bunch of routers, but instead of having a single point or multiple point of failures, now it is all interconnected against each other. So the most fault tolerant topology would be the this type of topology where everything is fully meshed. So meshed mean basically they are interconnected against each other. So this router, for example, site A router, if it needs to reach a site B router, it has multiple paths to reach it. It can reach through like this, it can reach through like that, it can reach through like that, it can reach through like that. So it has multiple connections. So the fully mesh is interconnected to each other in many different ways. Partially mesh topology, that connects many, but not all sites will have that kind of uh, interconnection. So in this situation on the right hand side, you have a partially mesh uh, example where site A, site B, site C are interconnected against each other, but the site D is only connected to site A. Therefore, you know, it is a partially mesh topology. So why would you want to implement a partially mesh topology over fully mesh topology? Again, it comes down to cost and complexity of your network. So you may be able to save some uh, funds by creating a partially mesh topology with redundancy uh, and fault tolerance built into a part of your network, but not your entire network uh, where you know that would be possible with the fully mesh topology because fully mesh topology will cost you more money to connect all of those devices, uh, all of those routers together, right? So that's why, why you know, why you may want to consider partially mesh topology over fully mesh topology. Carrier connections. Another aspect of WAN design is how an organization connects to the internet. An organization usually signs a service level agreement, also known as SLA, with a service provider. The SLA outlines the expected service relating to the reliability and availability of the connection. So you may have heard the term SLA and service level agreements, especially when uh, we are discussing cloud services. So I haven't done a specific lecture on cloud, but also cloud services have these agreements. And now in 2022, those cloud service providers, uh, you know, are becoming more and more popular among our network engineering and uh, system engineering people. Uh, you may have heard the uh, term with respect to, you know, the cloud services. But even when you are designing VANs, like a tr traditional VANs, we do have these SLAs, the service level agreements with the organization and the service provider. So if you are working for a company, they might have a SLA with the internet service provider ISP uh, that would uh, define uh, how reliability and availability of that connection will be handled. So the service provider may or may not uh, be uh, an actual carrier. A carrier owns and maintains the physical connection and equipment between the service provider and the customer, between the provider and the customer, right? Uh, that typically an organization will choose either a single carrier or dual carrier one connection. So a dual carrier situation could be that you could have Shore Cable and Rogers both providing uh, internet services to your large company so that you have Shore Rogers, uh, you know, uh, backup against each other in case of a failure of one of them and the service you will have service ag level agreements with either of uh, or both of those organizations to make sure that the services are provided to your organization accordingly so that's an an aspect of a van design that you should need to take into consideration if you are a network engineer a single carrier connection is when an organization connect to only one service provider, as I mentioned before, an SLA is negotiated between the organization and the service provider. So you have a corporation or a company on this side and you're gonna make an agreement with that service provider. A dual carrier connection provides, however, a redundancy and increase the network availability and the organization negotiates separate SLAs with the two different service providers. So you'll have two different SLAs, or sometimes in I've seen situation, they have SLA with a one service provider, but not the other. So it either could happen. Evolving networks. 
Network requirements of a company can change dramatically as the company grows over time. So a network must meet the day-to-day -day operational needs of the business and it must be able to adapt and grow as the company changes. So if the company changing environment requires a change in network systems, you should be able to adapt to that. Network designers and administrators meet these challenges by carefully choosing network topologies, technologies, protocols, and service providers. So they don't mention the topology here, but that is also a key feature. You need to also make sure you carefully choose the topology even from the very beginning and change those topologies as required, as well as the technologies, protocols, and service providers as well. Networks can be optimized by using a variety of network designing techniques and architectures. To illustrate differences between network size, we will use a fixed test company called Span Engineering and it grows from a small local business into a global enterprise. So in next few slides, we're gonna use this an example, this fake example of a company called Span Engineering uh, and we will see how it's going to evolve from a small local business into a global enterprise and how we're going to, uh, you know, um, um, come up with solution uh, to such change in the organizational structure. So at the very beginning, we have a small network. Span, a small uh, fetish company, uh, started with a few employees in a small office. It uses a single LAN connected to a wireless router for sharing data and peripherals. Connection to the internet is through a common broadband service called Digital Subscriber Line, also known as DSL. IT support is contracted from the DSL provider. So in other words, they don't have a in-house IT provider because they just start out of a small office. Let's say it started out of a basement of a somebody's, um, you know, the company owner's home, for example. So they just basically contract the IT services out to a, their DSL provider itself. Uh, so they don't have an in-house IT. So you have a small network. Within a few years, the span net uh, company grows uh, grows and requires several floors of building. So now we need a campus network. So it went from having a small company inside a somebody's house to a large uh, building base. Uh, you know, multi multi level uh, multi building multi. Uh, I would say multi floor building. Uh, you know, campus network. So the company now requires a campus area network, also known as a CAN. So as a result, a firewall secures the internet access to corporate users and they have added in-house IT staff to support and maintain this growing network. So a few years later, the company expanded again and added a branch site in the city and a remote and regional sites in other cities. So it went from being in a basement to a one single uh, building with multi uh, uh, multi uh, levels of uh, offices to now we have branches outside of that local area so the company now requires a metropolitan area network also known as a man to interconnect sites within the city to connect to the central office branch offices in the nearby cities use private dedicated lines to their local service provider so now we have a man situation as the company grows. Distributed network. So what happened now is the span engineering has now been in business for over 20 years and has grown to thousands of employees distributed in offices worldwide. So let's say you have offices in Canada, United States, somewhere in Africa, uh, somewhere in Europe and somewhere in Asia, for example. So now the site-to-site -site and remote access uh, virtual private network, also known as VPNs, enable the company to use the internet to connect easily and securely with employees and facilities around the world. So that's how you will be expanding from a small home office type of basement, uh, you know, started company or a garage started company into a large network. 
when operation when standards modern wan or wide area network standards are defined and managed by a number of organized authorities including the following ita or eia which are telecommunication industry association and electronic industries alliance iso which is the international organization for standardization and ieee which is the institute of electrical and electronics engineers if you have taken my previous lectures uh, or classes uh, on my youtube channel you probably already have heard these terms you should have uh, exposed to these uh, organizations in my previous lectures but if you haven't this is what they are stand for wans in the osi model the most wan standards focus on the physical layer and the data link layer so remember our osi model that i have discussed in multiple lectures in pa in the past so here's the osi model from the top down we have the application presentation session transport network data link and physical layer right remember that so wan or and wan standards mostly deal with the layer 1 and layer 2 so the layer 1 protocols includes the synchronous digital hierarchy also known as sdh synchronous optical networking also known as sonnet dense wavelength division multiplexing also known as dwdm layer 2 protocols include broadband which are dsl and cable wireless ethernet wan also known as metro ethernet multi-protocol label switching or mpls point-to-point -point protocol or ppps which are less used but still in use in some uh, situations high level data link control also known as hdlcs which are also less used frame relay which is a legacy uh, protocol that uh, not you often use anymore in 2022 asynchronous transfer mode also known as atm again a legacy protocol which is not necessarily implemented in modern day so these are just an overview of layer one and layer two wan protocols uh, that being uh, you know in, that you should be uh, familiar with okay so common wan terminology there are specific terms used to describe wan connections between the subscriber and the WAN service provider. So the subscriber is the company or the client and the WAN service provider is like your ISP, for example. So those are described on the uh, table on the left-hand side here. So the WAN term and the description on the right-hand side here. So the WAN term is the data terminal equipment or DTE, uh, which is uh, a device uh, that connects the subscriber lands to the WAN communication device. Data communication or data communications equipment, DCE, uh, which is a device used to communicate with the provider. Customer premises equipment, also known as CPE. Uh, this is a DTE and DCE devices located on the enterprise edge, so edge of the, uh, the net enterprise network. Point of presence, also known as POP, uh, the point where the subscriber connects to the service provider network. Demarcation point, which is the physical location in a building or complex that officially separates the CPE from the service provider equipment. So the demarcation point basically separates the customer premises equipment or CPE from the service provider's equipment. That's the demarcation point. So on the right hand side, we have a visual diagram of some of these items described here. So we have on here a, a campus with a data terminal equipment or DTE and data communication equipment DCE also in here. And right here, this division is that's where the cable junction point uh, box going to be where the your ISP cables and everything comes into your building. And that would be considered as the demarcation point. Typically on home networks or small business network, your uh, service provider's agreement ends at the demarcation point. So after your uh, service provider's router uh, or router modem combination or the modem, uh, what's going to happen is whatever after that here is your responsibility. 
So if you have a modem, for example, provided by your service provider, and you have a router attached to it, the router is your responsibility, or whatever happening in the router is your responsibility, but the modem and everything else uh, you know, behind it is going to be uh, belong to your ISP. So the ISP is going to be on this side and the, everything else is going to be your responsibility, right? So that's how it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, separated. So this is one of the reasons why, why we use the term enterprise edge and the service provider edge. So the demarcation point can divide the enterprise edge from the service provider edge. And on the other side, on the service provider side, we could have the local central office uh, uh, or CEO switch and then we could have the toll networks uh, and uh, you know et cetera et cetera so this is a really good diagram to understand these concepts uh, and uh, the, uh, again uh, to continue with those uh, van terms the local loop which is the last mile also known as last mile is the copper or fiber cable that connects the cpe to the ceo of the service provider this is this is the CEO of the service provider. The CEO, also known as central office, which I briefly mentioned on the previous slide, is the local service provider facility or building that connects the CPE to the provider network. So the CEO switch will connect multiple of the uh, you know the, these um, CPEs uh, to the uh, the provider network. Toll networks. Uh, those are uh, networks that include backhaul, long haul, all digital uh, fiber optic communication lines, switches, routers, and other equipment inside the WAN provider network. So remember that the tall networks are within the WAN provider networks that are basically backbone uh, of their uh, in network infrastructure, the ISP's infrastructure that includes the backhaul, long haul, all digital fiber optic communication lines, switches, routers, and other equipment associated with that. Backhaul network connects multiple access nodes of the service provider network, while the backbone network is a large high capacity networks used to interconnect service provider networks and to create a redundant network. So that's what the backbone network is doing compared to a backhaul network which connect multiple access nodes to the service provider network. WAN devices. So there are many types of devices that are specific to WAN environments. And they include the voice modem, uh, on, but on the side of your uh, slide, there is a nice uh, table that describes those. So one of them is called voice modem. Uh, those are dial-up modem that uses telephone lines and usually uh, with the legacy devices. DSL or cable modems, uh, those are collectively known as the broadband modems. So these are high-speed digital modems that connect to the DTE router using Ethernet. So most of your homes, your um, uh, modern day uh, uh, offices and small businesses as well as enterprises would have DSL and cable modems. CSU uh, or DSUs, uh, those are digital uh, lease uh, lines requires a CSU and a DSU and it connects a digital devices to digital lines. Optical converters, so those connects fiber optic media to copper media and convert optical signals to electrical pulses. So if you have fiber to home or fiber to uh, your enterprise uh, office, and then you would have those optical converters uh, where you need to uh, uh, convert some of those optical media into copper media where it is needed. Wireless router or access point and access points. So these devices are used to wirelessly connect a WAN, uh, connect to a WAN provider. So you can use the wireless routers and the access point to connect wirelessly between uh, you know WAN providers. So um, those are uh, typically used in Canada and parts of Europe, especially I don't know much about United States uh, to connect rural areas. So uh, the wireless uh, access points may be like an enterprise access point may be used even to connect between uh, WANs so that it'll you know connect uh, um, a large uh, geographical areas together without the need for pulling cables. WAN core devices, 
uh, Dosa WAN backbone consists of uh, multiple high speed routers and layer 3 switches. Dosa uh, consider as WAN core devices. So on the right hand side, we have a diagram uh, provided to us by again Cisco that gives you some of the uh, concepts uh, described on this table in a visual way. So you have uh, DTEs right here uh, showing and they have DCE here and then they are interconnecting through uh, the other networks on the other side through the WAN uh, with the core networks and you see the wireless um, devices optical converters and CSUs and DSU. So you can see them on the right hand side. Serial communication. Almost all network communications occur using a serial communication delivery. Serial communication transmits bits sequentially over a single channel. So remember that serial communication transmit bits sequentially over a single channel. That's what make it a serial communication. In contrast, parallel communication simultaneously transmits several bits using multiple wires. So if you if somebody in during your exams or quizzes, if they ask you the differences between a serial communication and a parallel communication, so this is the difference. Serial communication transmits bits sequentially over a single channel, while the in contrast, the parallel communication simultaneously transmits over um, uh, you know multiple wires. As the cable length increases, the synchronization timing between multiple channels become more sensitive to distance. For this reason, parallel communication is limited to a short distances. So remember that. Serial communication, there is no need for synchronization, so you can have large distances with minimal impact on it. However, with parallel communication as opposed to serial communication, synchronization matters so therefore what's going to happen is as the distance increases the parallel communication is limit uh, going to be a problem and going to have some uh, issues associated with it so parallel communication is distance sensitive and the serial communication is not distance sensitive because you don't need to synchronize anything circuit switch communication a circuit switch network establishes a dedicated circuit or channel between endpoints before the user can communicate. Establishes a dedicated virtual connection through the service provider network before communication can start. All communication uses the same path. The two most common types of this type of circuit switch when technologies are the public switch telephone network also known as PSTN, and Legacy Integrated Service Digital Network, also known as ISDN. So the PSDN and the ISDN are the two most commonly circuit switch networks. Packet switch communication. So this is something that you will be exposed to uh, not only this lecture, but in the future lectures that I'll be doing. Uh, because this is a something that we use almost uh, every day on our network engineering systems. So the network communication is most commonly implemented using packet switch communication. Segment traffic data into packets that are routed over a shared network. That is a key feature of packet switch network. It's segment traffic data into packets that are routed over a shared network much less expensive and more flexible than circuit switching and common types of packet switch WAN technologies includes the Ethernet WAN also known as Metro Ethernet, uh, multi-protocol label switching also known as MPLS, frame relay uh, which is a legacy system which sometimes in use and asynchronous transfer mode which is also a legacy system ATM that sometimes in use. So packet switch networks are important because they are currently the modern day standard for most WAN technologies. And you should uh, be familiar with this particular one more than anything else. SDH, Sonnet and DWDM. Service provider networks use fiber optic infrastructures to transport user data between destinations. Fiber optic cable is far superior to copper cable for long distance transmissions due to its much lower attenuation and interference. So the signal attenuation and signal interference is much less on fiber optic cables compared to copper cables. 
and I will go into depth of these uh, materials such as fiber optic and copper cables in my structured cabling uh, lectures that I'll be posting later sometime. But for now, just remember fiber optic cable is superior to copper cable when it's come to the point long distance transmission due to uh, the low attenuation and signal interference. There are two optical fiber or fiber optic OSI layer one standard available to service providers. They include SDH, which is synchronous high Di digital hierarchy, uh, which is a global standard for transporting data over fiber optic cable. The other one is SONET, which is the synchronous optical networking, which is a North American standard that provides the same services as the SDH. SDH and SONET define how to transfer multiple data, voice and video communications over fiber optic or optical fiber using lasers or light emitting diodes, also known as LEDs over great distances. Dense wavelength division multiplexing, also known as DWDM, is a newer technology that increases the data carrying cap capacity of SDH and SONET by simultaneously sending multiple streams of data, also known as multiplexing, using different wavelengths of lights. So, while SDH and uh, SONET define how we can transfer data, voice, video, communication over optical fiber systems using LEDs or lasers, the DWDM is a newer technology that increases that technology's abilities by carrying ca higher capacity of data by using multiple streams of uh, uh, you know data uh, or using different wavelengths of light. So DWDM is an improvement to the SDH and SONET. Traditional WAN connectivity. Traditional WAN connectivity options. To understand the WANs of today, it helps to know where they started. When LANs operated in the 1980s, the organizations began to see the need to interconnect with the other locations. To do so, they needed their networks to connect to the local loop of a service provider. This was accomplished by using dedicated lines or by using switch services from a service provider. So on the right hand side, you can see a type of a a traditional system where you have a lease line and you have a dedicated uh, system which connected to uh, the uh, the van networks or you will have is a circuit switch uh, or packet switch network with a uh, dedicated switching systems that would connect to a larger van network and then this would be basically uh, summarizing uh, how the lands operated in the 1980s and so on. So this is how it gonna going to work. So the lease line would be considered as the T1, E1, E3, E3 lines. So you probably heard those terms before. And then the other so switch networks known as IPSTN, uh, ISDN, frame relay, ATM, etc., etc. So those are so how traditionally how the WAN options have operated. So here are some uh, common WAN terminology. Point-to-point uh, -point lines uh, could be leased from a service provider and were called lease lines. And then the term refers to the fact that the organization pays a monthly lease fee to a service provider to use those lines. So they are leasing that line for they themselves to use, right? So the lease lines are available in different fixed capacities and are generally priced based on the bandwidth required and distance between the two connected points. And there are two systems used to define the digital capacity of a copper media serial link uh, that include the D, uh, sorry, T, uh, T carriers and E carriers. So you probably heard about T lines uh, and E lines, right? Those are uh, referred to T carriers and E carriers. So the T carriers used in North America and T carrier providers are T1 links, support bandwidth up to 1.544 megabyte per second and T3 links supporting bandwidth up to 43.7 megabyte per second. The E carriers which are used in Europe uh, and they provide E1 links supporting bandwidth up to 
2.048 megabyte per second and e3 links supporting bandwidth up to 34.368 megabyte per second and in asia i have seen they use both uh, t1 t3 lines as well as e1 and e3 lines so there is a mixture in asia because they adapt both the north american technologies and or european technologies rapidly in different areas of asia and on this slide we have summarized some common uh, and terminology and the advantages and disadvantages uh, of those uh, lease lines so uh, we have advantages of lease line that includes simplicity so it's point to point communication links that require minimal uh, expertise to install and maintain the quality so the point of point communication links are usually uh, high quality and uh, they have uh, adequate bandwidth uh, assuming that if they, you know you, the the lease line have the adequate bandwidth already uh, built into it uh, you know it will be very good compared to uh, using shared line because your organization would be the only organization that will be using that point to point communication availability so constant availability is essential for some applications such as e-commerce also healthcare for example so point to point communication links provide permanent dedicated capacity which is required uh, for VoIP uh, or video uh, over uh, IP uh, system so you can provide a very good quality ser uh, services to, for those VoIP and video systems however there are disadvantages associated with those lease lines they include cost so point to point links are generally the most expensive type of WAN access therefore the cost of lease line solutions can become significant when they are used to connect many sites over increasing distances because remember the lease lines are you are having a dedicated line so you are uh, paying your service provider to use that line for you yourself and your organization therefore the cost of the, uh, that line is much more expensive than shared lines limited flexibility is another issue so the van traffic is often variable and lease lines have a fixed capacity so the bandwidth of the line high, you know seldom matches the need uh, exactly so if your um, traffic varies when a high usage to low usage all the time so the lease line cannot adapt to that rapidly because you know it is it has a very limited flexibility as opposed to shared lines circuit switch options circuit switch connections can provide by provided by a public service telephone network also known as pstn carriers the local loop connecting the cpe to co is copper media there are two traditional circuit switch options those are pstn and isdn which i have briefly mentioned on our previous slides so the PSTN, also known as Public Service Telephone Network, is a type of dial-up WAN access uh, that uses the PSTN that is uh, in its WAN connection. Traditional local loops can transport binary computer data through the voice telephone network using a voice band modem. The physical characteristic of the loop, sorry, local loop and its connection to the PSTN limit the rate of the signal to less than 56 kilobyte per second. So that the maximum you can do in a PSTN is 56 kilobyte per second. That is where you may have heard about the, uh, you know, the network interface cards that are uh, limited to 56 kilobyte per second in the old days. The Integrated Service Digital Network, also known as ISDN, is a, also a circuit switching technology that enables the PSDN local loop to carry digital signals. So as opposed to analog signals, now we are carrying the digital signals. This provided higher capacity switch connections than the dial-up access. Hence, the ISDN provides for data rates from 45 kilobyte per second all the way up to 2.048 megabyte per second packet switch options packet switching segments data into packets that are routed over a shared network so that is one of the key features of packet switching as i mentioned before it actually segments data into packets that then can be routed over a shared network it allows many pairs of nodes to communicate over the same channel 
there are two traditional, also known as legacy switch options. They include frame relay and ATM. So the frame relay is a simple layer to non-broadcast multi-access, also known as NBMA, WAN technology that is used to interconnect enterprise LANs. The frame relay creates PVCs, which are uniquely identified by a data link connection identifier, also known as DLCI. The other option is the asynchronous transfer mode, also known as the ATM. So the asynchronous transfer mode technology is capable of transferring voice, video, and data through private and public networks. ATM is built on a cell-based architecture rather than a frame-based architecture. So ATM cells are always a fixed length of 53 bytes. Please note the frame relay and ATM networks have been largely replaced by faster metro, ethernet, and internet-based solutions. So remember that these are kind of legacy device uh, technologies, but maybe still in use in some remote parts of the world and some parts of your network as well. But however, they are legacy and they are being replaced by the metro, ethernet, and internet-based solutions. So let's look at the modern WAN connectivity. Modern WANs. Modern WANs have more connectivity options than traditional WANs. Enterprises now require faster and more flexible WAN connectivity options. Traditional WAN connectivity options have rapidly declined in use because they are either no longer available, too expensive, or have limited bandwidth. So on the right hand side, there's a figure that displays the local loop connections most likely to be encountered today. So we have the, we have, we have the cellular, net wireless and uh, satellite communication. Those are all modern day networks. And on this side of the internet, we have the fiber optics or optical fiber, telephone lines and coaxial cable. So those are all modern day as well. So we still use all of these things in 2022. So the modern day WAN connectivity options are described here in a, as a summary. So we have new technologies that are continually emerging. The figure on the right hand side basically summarize those modern WAN connectivity options. And they include dedicated broadband, which is a fiber uh, can be installed independently by the organization to connect remote locations directly together. Dark fiber can be leased uh, for or purchase for a supplier as well. So you have that option in the dedicated uh, broadband right here. So the dark fiber connections uh, that can be used. And packet switched option, so that's this option, uh, that includes Metro Ethernet that replacing many traditional WAN options uh, now being replaced by those Metro Ethernet systems. And the MPLS, the MPLS enables sites to connect to the provider regardless of its access technology. So the MPLS allow us to use any technology here, but it is still unable to connect to the provider's um, you know, network. The other one is the internet-based uh, broadband. So internet-based broadband. So that is an organizations um, now commonly using the global internet infrastructure for WAN connectivity. So basically, we already have global uh, internet infrastructure so built, so we're gonna use that, kind of piggyback on that, or use that already existing infrastructure uh, to uh, for WAN connectivity. So those are the modern connectivity options available uh, for WAN. Ethernet WAN. So service providers now offer Ethernet WAN service using fiber optic cabling. The Ethernet WAN service can go by many names, including the following. They include Metropolitan Ethernet, also known as Metro E, Ethernet over MPLS, also known as EO MPLS, Virtual Private LAN Service, also known as VPLS. There are several benefits to Ethernet WANs. They include reduced expenses and administration, easy integration with existing networks, enhance business productivity. 
Please note the Ethernet wangs have gained in popularity and are now commonly being used to replace the traditional serial point-to-point -point frame relay and ATM WAN links. In fact, if you are deploying a WAN technology in uh, uh, modern day today in 2022 in Canada, you won't be using any of those traditional ones that we described before, but you will be using uh, one of these items. So the Metro E, uh, EO MPLS or VPLS. MPLS. MPLS, also known as the multi-protocol label switching, is a high-performance service provider when routing technology to interconnect clients without uh, regard to access method or payload. So the MPLS supports a variety of client access methods uh, such as Ethernet, DSL, cable, frame relay, etc, etc. MPLS can encapsulate all types of protocols including IPv4 and IPv6 traffic. MPLS router can be a customer edge or CE router a provider edge or PE router or an internal provider also known as P router. MPLS routers are label switch routers also known as LSRs. They attach labels to packets that are then used by other MPLS routers to forward traffic. MPLS also provides services for QoS also known as quality of service support, traffic engineering, redundancy, and VPN. So it allow traffic shaping and QoS uh, in the MPLS infrastructure. So in here, uh, there is an example of an MPLS cloud system uh, where these uh, in, uh, uh, routers, edge, also known as CEs, the customer edge uh, routers are connecting to. Uh, I will go over MPLS in a little more in depth and detail in my future videos. Uh, as well as my future lab demonstrations. But for now, this is what you need to understand with respect to MPLS. Internet-based connectivity. Internet-based connectivity options. Internet-based broadband connectivity is an alternative to using dedicated WAN options. Internet-based connectivity can be divided into wired and wireless options. And the wired options includes uh, the options uh, use the permanent uh, cabling, such as copper or fiber cables, to provide consistent bandwidth and reduce error rates and latency. This includes DSL, cable connections, and optical fiber networks. While the wireless options includes um, the, the 3G, 4G, and 5G systems, as well as the satellite internet services, and these wireless options are less expensive to implement compared to the, uh, the wired uh, options because they are uh, using the radio waves to communicate uh, with each other. Wireless signals can be negatively affected, however, by factors such as distance from the radio towers, interference from other sources, and weather. So on the right hand side, uh, this is a, a easy diagram uh, to just look at uh, where internet based connectivity options, uh, broadband VPNs. So we have the wired via DSL, five, fiber optics, cable, etc. While the wireless, we have the municipal Wi Fi, cellular, satellite internet, and WiMAX. DSL technology. Digital subscriber line, also known as DSL, is a high-speed, always-on connection technology that uses existing twisted pair telephone lines to provide IP services to users. DSL are categorized as either asymmetric or symmetric uh, in, in our you know, technological methodologies. So asymmetric DSL is known as ADSL, while the symmetric DSL is known as SDSL. ADSL and ADSL2 Plus provide higher downstream bandwidth to user than upload uh, bandwidth. So it, ADSL and ADSL2 Plus provide higher downstream bandwidth o over the uh, you know the upload uh, bandwidth. SDSL provides the same capacity in both directions. So it's a unidirection same capacity here, as opposed to ADSL you provide higher downstream. Sorry, the 
uh, uh, downstream bandwidth over uh, the uh, upload uh, uh, bandwidth, right? So those are the differences between ADSL and SDSL. Uh, DSL transfer rates are depend on the actual length of the local loop and the type and the condition of the cabling. So the DSL um, quality of service or the I, I would say DSL service, uh, uh, you know, the qualities will depend on the actual length of the local loop. So if you are connected to a local uh, network, uh, your ISP's local DSL loop, uh, and the type of conditions of the cabling within that loop will have an impact on you know the DSL transfer rates. So on the right hand side, you can see the ADSL uh, data, uh, you know uh, streams, and then in here we, it shows uh, that the signals uh, where the upstream have uh, you know less compared to downstream, which have more in the ADSL method. So this is just an image to just to give you an idea about you know how that works. DSL connections. Service providers deploy DSL connections in the local loop. The connection is set up between the DSL modem and the DSL access multiplexer, also known as DSLAM. The DSL modem converts the Ethernet signals from the teleworker device to a DSL signal, which is transmitted to a DSL access multiplexer, also known as a DSLAM, at the provider location. A DSLAM is located at the central office, CO, of the provider and concentrates connections from multiple DSL subscribers. So remember that a DSL LAM, so DSLAM is located at the central office CEO and what the main function of that is, is that it concentrates connection from multiple DSL subscribers. DSL is not a shared medium. Each user has a separate direct connection to the DSLAM. Adding users does not impede the performance of other users as a result. So if you look at this diagram on the bottom of the screen that Cisco has provided to us, you have the user and the user has a DSL modem and it is being connected to a DSLAM that's gonna get concentrated with multiple DSL connections and that would give you the connection to the outside networks. DSL and PPP. ISPs use PPP as the layer two protocol for broadband DSL connections. PPP can be used to authenticate the subscriber. It can assign a public IPv4 address to the subscriber and it can provide link quality management features. There are two ways PPP over ethernet also known as PPPoE can be deployed. They include host with PPOE client. In that situation, the PPPOE client software communicates with the DSL modem using the PPPOE and the modem communicates with the ISP using PPP. The other option is the router PPPOE client. In that situation, the router is the PPPOE client and obtains its configuration from the provider. So these are the two ways where PPP over Ethernet can be deployed. On the bottom of your screen, that uh, you know Cisco has provided to us again uh, a diagrams showing uh, those two uh, deployment. In this case, we have the DSL modem, and that is acting as that. Uh, and in here, we have a PP. Uh, POE client, um, uh, you know, in the router here, but here PPOE client is client itself. So <clears throat> the, the right before the modem, we have the PPPOE client, and that's how, you know, the host with the PPPOE client gonna connect. But in here, we have the router here with the PPPOE client, and that is going to be the one gonna do the uh, the PPPoE configuration. So that's what is shown in here. Cable technology. Cable technology is a high speed always on connection technology that uses a coaxial cable from the cable company to provide IP services to users. 
The Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification, also known as DOTSIS, is the international standard for adding high bandwidth data to an existing cable system. So if you have purchased the cable internet, you may have heard the term DOTSIS modem, uh, and that's where it comes from. DOTSIS stands for Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. Most Canadian major cities, uh, you have the ability to get cable internet and that would be using this standard. The optical node converts RF signals to light pulses over fiber optic cable. The fiber media enables the signals to travel over long distances to the provider head end where a cable modem termination system also known as CMTS is located. The head end contains the databases needed to provide internet access while the CMTS is responsible for communicating with the cable modems. So on the bottom of your screen, you have a diagram that's describing what we have just discussed here. So we have a cable modem that is in your you know, end, in end user side and that will have a coaxial cable to an optical node and then that optical node will have a optical fiber connection to CMTS on the head end of that network and that is what allowing uh, this communication WAN topology to work. Not all local subscribers share the same cable bandwidth in this situation. So unlike the DSL, in here, all local subscribers share the same cable bandwidth. As more users join the service, available bandwidth may drop below the expected rate. So the cable company or the internet service provider had to upgrade their network as the subscribers get increases. Optical fiber. Many municipalities, cities, and providers install fiber optic cable to the user's location. This is in Canada often time being marketed, uh, marketed as fiber to home, right? So this is commonly referred to as fiber to something, you know, FTTX, and includes the following. As I mentioned, fiber to the home or FTTH, where fiber reaches the boundary of the resident. So in basically it goes all the way to the demarcation point, you will have fiber. Fiber to the building, in that case the fiber reaches all the way to the boundary of the building with the final connection to the individual living spaces being made via uh, other means. So it will come all the way to the demarcation point of the building, uh, such as an apartment complex for example. Fiber to node or neighborhood is also known as FTTN. In that situation, the optical uh, cabling reaches an optical node that converts optical signal to a format acceptable for twisted pair or coaxial cable to the premise. In that case, it'll go to a some kind of a junction box near your neighborhood, and then from there, it will be using the coaxial uh, regular cable to distribute. Please note, FTTX can deliver the highest bandwidth of all broadband options. And especially when you have fiber to home and fiber to building, after the demarcation point, if you decided to add uh, your internal LAN connections also with fiber network interface cards and fiber channels, what's gonna happen is it will the speed gonna reach all the way to your end user. So that is one of the advantages of FTTCX system because it has a consistent fiber medium. You can build all the way to your user if you have your LAN connections also working on uh, fiber. So in 2022, I don't see many um, end devices with direct fiber connections. Typically they are all CAT5 or CAT6 cables. So you will have a fiber converter uh, at the demarcation point. Uh, but I do see some high-end uh, servers nowadays comes with direct fiber connections where you can connect a fiber optic line or optical fiber line directly to the demarcation point or the modem. Wireless internet-based broadband. So the wireless technology uses the unlicensed radio spectrum to send and receive data. This is a very key piece of information that a lot of students get confused about. 
The wireless technology uses the unlicensed radio spectrum to send and receive data. So some people often think it has to be licensed, but no, the wireless technology actually uses the unlicensed radio spectrum to send and receive data. That, uh, that is a question that do show up on your Cisco exams. And those uh, wireless technologies include municipal Wi-Fi. So municipal wireless networks are available in many cities providing high-speed internet access for free. Uh, or for substantially less than the price of uh, the broadband services. So some cities in North America and Europe, uh, you will see municipally run Wi-Fi networks. Cellular systems, in that case, um, uh, what happened is that uh, the devices are being uh, uh, connected to the internet uh, using radio waves to communicate through nearby mobile cell phone towers, and they would use 3G, 4G, and 5G uh, technologies and long-term evolution, also known as LTE, uh, to communicate uh, against and with each other. So those are cellular networks. So if you have ever used a cell phone or if you have currently have a cell phone, that will be using those cellular networks. The other one is a satellite internet. They are typically used by uh, you know they are typically used by rural uh, users in Canada and United States, as well as in other parts of the world, uh, because it is much easy to uh, get uh, access to. Uh, and a router connects a wireless, uh, sorry, a router connects a satellite dish, which is pointed to a service provider satellite in a geosynchronous orbit. And then um, the only downside of this is that the trees and heavy rains can impact the satellite signals. Also, some types, uh, certain types of weather condition in Canada, such as uh, snow conditions, can impact your satellite connections and speed. Another disadvantage of satellite internet uh, is that uh, it may be more costly, oftentimes it is more costly than the DSL and cable. However, because it allow the rural users to access the internet where the cable and DSL is not available, it is still in use. Another option, uh, the reason why satellite uh, internet is being used is that if you have mobile systems, such as uh, if you have a boat or if you have some kind of RV, you may want to install satellite internet because it allows us that flexibility of getting the internet anywhere in the world. The other one is called WiMAX, which is stand for Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access. As is described uh, in the IEEE 802.16 standard, provides high-speed broadband service with wireless access and provides broad coverage like a cell phone network rather than through a small Wi-Fi hotspot. So it provides a similar type of coverage as a cell phone network coverage using the WiMAX technology rather than just using small uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. So those are some wireless internet-based broadband technologies. VPN technology. VPNs can be used to address security concerns uh, that may occur when a remote office worker uses broadband services to access the corporate WAN over the internet. So a VPN is an encrypted connection between private networks over a public network. So VPN by definition is an encrypted connection between a private networks over a public network. So they are connecting private networks, but it is going through a public network uh, via encryption. VPN tunnels are routed through the internet from the private network of the company to the remote site or employee host. There are several benefits of using VPN. They include cost savings, eliminates expensive dedicated WAN links and modern banks that needed to have um, if without the VPN because now we are using the public network to transmit data. Security, which is uh, allow us to use advanced encryption and authentication protocols to protect data from unauthorized access. Scalability, so the corporation can add large amount of uh, capacity without adding a significant infrastructure. So the infrastructure cost gets significantly reduced. An example of this would be during COVID-19, a lot of companies have sent their workers to work from home and they rapidly scale uh, they are, uh, you know, remote workforce by u using VPN technologies because it's just basically using the public network and they don't have to spend much uh, infrastructure cost on uh, implementing it. So you can basically send your workers home with a VPN client uh, installed on the laptops and they can go ahead and connect to their your uh, corporate networks from their home securely. 
compatibility with broadband technology supported by broadband service providers such as DSL and cable so the VPN can work through either cable or DSL systems with no issues at all so it is very easy just plug and play for the end user once it's properly set up VPNs are commonly implemented as following they include site-to-site -site VPN and remote access VPN so site-to-site -site VPN is a special type of VPN setting that are configured on routers where clients are unaware that the data is being encrypted Remote access, that's where the user is aware and initiates the remote access connection, such as your uh, office worker who's working from a, a remote area, like such as from, uh, working from home. It's so like, for example, using HTTPS in a browser to connect to your bank is also a type of you know, encryption system. Uh, also, users can run VPN client software, as I mentioned, on their host to connect to the uh, system and authenticate with the destination device. So in most cases during COVID-19, most companies have given uh, their workers laptops with the VPN client software installed on it, such as Cisco AnyConnect, for example. Uh, and that will allow the users to use IPsec and SSL uh, systems to connect to the VPN on the destination device. So that's the remote access matter. So we have site-to-site -site VPN and remote access. ISP connectivity options. There are different ways an organization can connect to an ISP. The choice depends on the needs and the budget of the organization. The, those connections of ISP connectivity include single homed. So in that situation, a single connection to the ISP using one link provides no redundancy and is the least expensive solution. And this is what you most likely gonna see in your home. So if you buy uh, a internet service uh, providers package, they will probably gonna have a single home type of connection to your home. The other option called dual home that connects the same ISP using two links uh, that provides both redundancy and load balancing. However, the organization loses internet connectivity if the ISP experiences an outage. So the dual home situation, you have two dead lines, like physical lines connecting uh, to your ISP, but you are using the same ISP. So if there is a failure in the ISP, you have a single point of failure, hence you will lose the internet uh, connectivity. Multi-homed, uh, this is a situation where the client connects to two different ISPs and this design provide increased redundancy and enable load balancing between those two ISPs. But however, it can be very expensive. So you are using two service providers. As I mentioned uh, previously, like you can use Show Cable and Rogers, for example, to connect to your corporate network in Calgary. And what's gonna happen is the Calgary corporate office now have two lines uh, associated with two independent ISPs in Rogers and um, show if the show goes out, no problem. Rogers is there, Rogers goes out. Hopefully you will have the show there. So that's how the multi-home works. Uh, the next one is called dual multi-homed. Uh, dual multi-home is the most resilient topology of the four types and the client connects with redundant links to multiple ISPs. So this topology provides the most redundancy possible. However, it is the most expensive option to use because it is expensive. It is not uh, implemented uh, as often as the other items up here. Uh, the most common one you will see is the single home and the other one may be dual home. Not so much the multi-home and dual home unless you are working for a large corporation or company. And uh, in dual home, what happened? They are combining these two together. So the, they, are, they are combining dual home and multi-home together pretty much. So you have two ISPs, but each ISP going to have two links connected to it. So therefore, it not only have redundancy built into it, but also it also uh, allow the high availability because if, if the ISP goes down, you have this ISP, but if one of the link to one of those ISP goes down, the other link will still operate as well. Uh, in this situation. But however, as I mentioned, I hardly see any dual home uh, configuration other than in large corporation and large companies uh, that uh, use that. So most of the time you will be working with single home or dual home, maybe sometimes multi-home. Broadband solution comparison. So each broadband solution has advantages and disadvantages. If there are multiple broadband solutions available, 
a cost versus benefit analysis should be performed to determine the best solution. So as a network engineer, as a network technician, if you were to ask by your employer to figure out, uh, you know, a, what are the cost benefit um, right, of uh, using one of those items, you, you know, you should be able to, you know, understand these concepts and decide based on the company needs and the available options. So some factors to consider includes the following. With cables, the bandwidth is shared by many users. So therefore upstream data rates are often slow during high usage hours in areas with over subscription. So this plays into the fact that the location matters. So you may be uh, in an area where the cable service provider ISP have very few users or very, um, low bandwidth usage, even with many users, maybe there are mostly with small businesses that don't use much bandwidth and then your home or your big corporation that use a lot of bandwidth is located in that area, you hardly may see any issues with that. So long time ago, like 10 years ago uh, in uh, Calgary where, where I am, uh, I had some issues with uh, internet speeds during uh, night times because I am in uh, a residential area and uh, high bandwidth usages usually happen at night times. However, uh, as time goes by, uh, it got improved. So the ISP has improved. So this all uh, play into that. So over subscription may or may not uh, be permanent, it be a permanent issue or a temporal issue. So you may have an area where you have an over subscription issue, but your ISP take actions to mitigate it. Uh, this may be, uh, you know, overcome by that. DSL, so the limited band uh, with that is distance sensitive. So in relation to ISP central office, uh, where if you are far away from the ISP central office, your, um, you know, bandwidth gonna go down because the distance increase because the DSL has a, a impact on the distance as opposed to cable that doesn't have that issue. The upload rate is also proportionally lower compared to the download rate. So typically most DSLs are a, you know, a lower uh, upload rate compared to the download rate. So that may have an impact on your organization. Fiber to the home. This option requires fiber insulation directly to the home. Uh, it is advantageous for speeds, however, it may be costly. So most fiber to home network connections are more expensive. Uh, the packages are more expensive and this, uh, the also the equipment associated with that may be more expensive. Cellular and mobile systems. Uh, with this option, the coverage is often an issue. Um, so even within a small office or home office where bandwidth is relatively limited, uh, you know, those uh, can be uh, mitigated, uh, like a, can be an issue that you need to be uh, aware of, that you need to mitigate. So cellular uh, mobile network have major two issue, issues. One is the coverage issue. The other one is the bandwidth issues. Municipal Wi-Fi, the most municipalities in Canada at least do not have mesh Wi-Fi network deployed. Uh, even in United States, I don't know many cities that have that. So if it is available in range, then it is a viable, good option to you for the internet. But one thing that is not mentioned here is that I'm not sure how good the municipal Wi-Fi security is on most networks. So unless it is properly secured, you may want to also use municipal Wi-Fi along with a combination of a VPN because municipal Wi-Fi may not be also as secure as the other options because this is basically a like a communal use of the internet, right? So be careful with that. Satellite. So this option is expensive and provides limited capacity per subscriber and typically used when no other option is available such as rural areas. And as I mentioned before, satellite system is prone to have issues with weather patterns uh, that uh, can hinder your ability to connect to the internet. So there's a lab called Configure and Verify Extended IPv4 ACLs. If you have access to this lab, please go ahead and do it. But if you do not, I will try to find a copy and post to my sanuji.com website so you can download and do them. That would bring us to the end of this lecture. I will quickly introduce some packet tracer files that you can do, and then I'll go over a summary of what we have covered. So there's a packet tracer file called WAN concepts. 
Again, if you have access to this packet tracer file, please go ahead and do it. But if you do not, I will try to find a copy and post to my sanjay.com website as well as uh, show you a live demonstration on my YouTube channel sometime later. So here is a summary of what we have learned. So we're going to cover that in the next few slides. We learn a wide area network, also known as WAN, is required to connect beyond the boundary of the LAN or local area network. A private WAN is a connection that is dedicated to a single customer. A public WAN connection is typically provided by an ISP or telecommunication service provider using the internet. WANs are implemented using the following logical topologies, point to point, hub and spoke, dual home, fully mesh and partially mesh. You should know what these are and the differences between those for your exams and quizzes. A dual carrier connection provides redundancy and increases network availability. The organization negotiates separate service level agreements, also known as SLAs, with two different service providers in that situation. Side-to-side -side and remote access virtual private networks, also known as VPNs, enable the company to use the internet to securely connect with employees and facilities around the world. We learn modern, modern uh, uh, modern WAN standards are defined and managed by a number of uh, recognized uh, organizations that include the ITA, EIA, ISO, and IEEE. We learn about layer one optical fiber protocol standards include SDH, Sonnet, and DWDM. Layer two protocols define how data will be encapsulated into a frame. The layer two protocols include broadband, wireless, Ethernet, WAN, MPLS, PPP, and HDLC. We learn that the serial communication transmit bits sequentially over a single channel. In contrast, parallel communication simultaneously transmits several bits using multiple wires. So the two most common types of circuit switched WAN technologies are PSTN and ISDN. The common types of packet switch WAN technologies are Ethernet WAN and MPLS. And there are two optical uh, fiber I OSI one, uh, layer one standards. SDH uh, or Sonnet define how to transfer multiple data, voice, uh, and video communications over optical fiber using lasers or LEDs over great distances. Circuit switch connections were provided by PSTN carriers and ISDN is a circuit switching technology that enables the PSTN local loop to carry digital signals. We also learn packet switching segments, data, into packets that are routed over a shared network. So that's how packet switching work. Just like the name described, it switch packets. So it's, it's segment data into packets and then it switch through the network. Frame relay and simple layer two NBMA WAN technology used in to interconnect enterprise LANs. But remember the frame relays and those are kind of legacy WANs. ATM technology is capable of transferring voice, video, data through private and public networks. Again, it is also a type of legacy WAN that still may be in use. It is built on uh, a cell-based architecture rather than a frame-based architecture. We also learn about the modern WAN connectivity options includes dedicated broadband, Ethernet WAN, and MPLS, which is packet switched along with various wired and wireless versions of the internet-based broadband. We learn MPLS is a high-performance service provider WAN routing technology to interconnect client. So if somebody asks what is an MPLS, that is the easiest way to describe it. It is a high-performance service provider WAN routing technology that uses to interconnect clients. MPLS supports a variety of client access methods such as Ethernet, DSL, cable, frame relay. MPLS can encapsulate all types of pack, uh, protocols, uh, including IPv4 and IPv6 traffic. So the MPLS allow you to, uh, to interconnect uh, your clients regardless of what the client's technology is being used. 
internet-based broadband connectivity is an alternate to using dedicated WAN options. And we learned the examples of wired broadband connectivity are digital subscriber line, also known as DSL, and cable connections and op fib optical fiber networks. Examples of wireless broadbands include cellular 3G, 4G, 5G, or satellite internet uh, services. And we also learned satellite is mostly common in rural areas. DSL is a high-speed, always-on connection technology that uses existing twisted pattern telephone lines to provide IP services to users. We also learned cable technology is a high-speed, always-on connection technology that uses a cable company's coaxial cable to provide IP services to users, and it is typically faster than DSL. We learned the newer developments in wireless technology include municipal Wi-Fi, cellular, satellite internet, and WiMAX. We also learned VPN tunnels are routed through the internet from private networks of companies to the remote site or employee host. ISP connectivity options include single home, dual home, multi-home, and dual multi-home. So those are some ISP connectivity options. So that would bring us to the end of this module. If you like these type of lectures, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. I will make sure to go over some of those packet tracer activities on my YouTube channel and post it so that you can have a better idea about what we have covered. If you have any questions or concerns regarding any of the items that we have covered, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Until next time, good luck and have a nice day.